uh, Diane and I have talked about uh, similar things uh, in the, the the example that comes to my mind, obviously, really quickly with that is, is and this is something that she and I have talked about and pertaining to that, is the, the example that, that Christ gave us when he, when he let Peter walk on the water. Yes. Uh, you know, Peter wanted to draw closer to God. He was always that kind of person, pushing, trying to, trying to draw closer. And uh, it just seems fitting that he would ask Jesus to let me walk on the water. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that he knew what he was getting into. Sometimes that's the way things are. Drawing closer to God means uh, a lot more turmoil sometimes, a lot more storms, a lot more difficult. Um, and it is human nature to focus on all of that storm, all of those waves, all of that uncertainty, all of the difficulty. It is very difficult to not focus on that. But that's why we have to go through the lessons that we've gone through before, transforming our minds to understand that we don't need to be anxious for nothing, that we need to continue to focus on Christ, to focus on everything that He's promised us, everything He's going to do in our lives, because uh, if we do focus on everything else, we'll see our lives do just what Peter did, began to say. Yes, However, we serve a wonderful God that even when He sank, He said, Lord, save me. And immediately the Bible says, the Bible uses the word immediately, Jesus reached down and picked him up and lifted him up, and that's what he will do in our lives. He's not going to leave us. Uh, it, it, so if by chance you do get, begin to sink in your circumstances, don't, don't hesitate. Don't, don't fret. Don't think less of yourself. You call out to God because he's going to help you up. This is a growing process. This is a learning process. I told my wife a couple years ago in that scripture, the most wonderful words that, that Christ said to Peter was come. And the reason why that was important is because he was telling Peter, this storm that you want to get out in, I'm already in it. Just come on to me. Uh, you, you're wanting to come out into a storm, but through that, you're going to get closer to me. So, so come out. He's not asking us to come somewhere he's not. He's already in it. So he, he, he's going to get us. That'll be a closer walk with him if we can get through that, if we can focus on him. So don't let the storm get you off track. Call on him. Don't worry about it. Just call on him. Uh, and he'll help you through it. Yes, ma'am. Um, last week I shared something with Tracy, and um, it was back when my head was spinning a little bit more than it was. But anyway, she asked me would I share it. But uh, I had told her about this devotional, Sarah Young. I know a lot of people probably know about this devotional. It's so awesome, and it says God is speaking to you. But I read it, and I called it one morning because it, so, it was like on time for me. It said, make me your focal point <clears throat> as you're moved through the, this day. Just as a spinning ballerina must keep returning her eyes to a given point to maintain her balance, so you must keep returning your focus to me. Amen. Circumstances are in a flux and the world seems to be just whirling around you. And it was, you know. And it, the only way to keep your balance is to fix your eyes on me, the one who never changes. If you gaze too long at your circumstances, you will become dizzy and confused. Look to me, refreshing you in my presence, and your steps will be made steady and sure. And then she gives scripture in Hebrews and Psalms here. But it's like, whenever they, the first day I, Brian was there and he, I had shared it with him, that I was had a one bad day of the cyst on the brain and may have to have brain surgery and all this stuff and all that. So my whole focus was on that. Yeah. But when I reminded myself, the Spirit reminded me, and then I had to talk to me and say, hey, where's all this you're bragging and telling everybody about your peace, no matter what is put in your path? So the devil was trying to take my peace, and I took it back. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh no, when I go in there to that surgeon, I'll face whatever I have to face, because God, you're there. Mm -hmm. You're here. You'll be there then. You'll be there afterwards. Yes. And I'll still have my peace, devil, you will not take my peace nor my joy. Mm -hmm. And when I went in there, of course, you know the story, they couldn't even hardly find the cyst on the CD. Mm -hmm. uh, so, anyway, it, it, if nobody's read this, this is awesome uh, devotional. Mm -hmm. It just says God, and it just seems to be right on time with whatever you're going through. Mm -hmm. God is that way. Yes. God yes. can uh, yes. be on time no matter what you're dealing with. Yes. Uh, that's tough to remember. But he will be on time. So, well, we've got a lot to cover. Let's try to dive in. I am. Uh, don't be surprised if we get to it, but don't be surprised if we don't get to it all today. Uh, there's not a lot on your paper, but uh, in my opinion, there's not. But uh, some of it will have to just be discussion. Uh, I, I 
I try to teach. I'm not a good curriculum writer. Uh, I do the best I can, and I pray a lot and ask God to help me with the rest. So, uh, and, and I ask the Holy Spirit to teach y'all, teach y'all what I can. So uh, you, we need to uh, rely on Him uh, and, and, and ask Him to be with us throughout this. So as you know, we've been dealing with build-up toward the spiritual gifts. Now, if you have read the scriptures that we've been dealing with, chapter 12, 13, and 14, you'll see that chapter 12 pretty quickly spells out what the gifts of the Spirit are. However, I took the opposite approach. I've dealt with everything else. Now, I want to tell you why I did that. We have such a tendency in our modern culture to believe we already know what we're familiar with. We've read it. Maybe we don't understand it all, but we have things built up in our mind based on what we've experienced or what we've read or what people have told us so that when people reference the spirit, uh, the gifts of the Spirit, our mind begins to think a certain way already. And some of that is part of the problem uh, because we've been taught by a tradition of men more than Scripture and we have a tendency to believe what we've been told more than what the Scripture says. So what I've tried to do is build a foundation of what God wants us to understand going into these things that maybe... Uh, that, that Paul was dealing with Gentiles who, who obviously have a similar case of what we have today, that they were all about the tongues, because if you read through it, he has to deal with that a lot more than any other spiritual gift out there, that, that there's an abuse of it, if you will, um, in, in Corinthians, in these couple chapters, and that's what we're dealing with today, but he's dealing with Gentiles. He's not dealing with third, fourth, fifth generation Pentecostal people. He's dealing with people who have just gotten into this thing and, and they are running with it wide open and it is, it, they're running with it a little bit incorrectly as well and he's trying to fix that. We have been in church for many generations, a lot of us, or church, I, I'm second generation Church of God myself. My mother grew up in the Church of God. When she was 16, got saved and been in Church of God ever since. I was there every time the doors was open and we have to rethink what we've been programmed to think. N it, it, just to make sure that we're not following tradition of men. So I've tried to position these lessons in a way uh, as best I could feel that the Lord was leading me to try to get some foundation, some biblical foundation, not man's traditions foundation, but biblical foundation so that we can think right as we go through here. Because as we get into the gifts, and we're going to deal with one today, we won't need one per uh, lesson, a lesson per gift, because most of them we don't deal with enough to, to, to have to correct a lot. Uh, and some of them are very easily understood and we accept them. This one is just one that is very misunderstood uh, in our day. So we need to understand though as we get into them that the edification of the church, use, being used by God for the purpose of building up the body of Christ is the primary, the singular tool that, that, that these things are for. To, to help grow, build up the church. There, and, and that has to be our primary focus. We can't get off on making ourselves feel better by, by uh, accepting man's tradition, uh, whether that be man's tradition to say, that because there are man's tradition out there that says the, the Holy Ghost and the speaking in tongues is not for now. It was for back then, and it is not for now. That's man's tradition. I, I disagree, and the Bible never indicates that at all. So, uh, it, it so we need to do away with that man's tradition, but we need to also make sure that we're not getting over too far in man's tradition that, that abuses the, the, the spirit and the tongues and all of that too. So we need to make sure that God is our focus, that we are being driven by love, that we are being driven by the edifying of the church, and that needs to be our primary focus. And if you read chapter 14, he mentions edifying more than he mentions tongues. Or, or I'm sorry, he doesn't mention it more, but he, he emphasizes edification more than speaking in tongues. That's the message he's trying to get across. And you'll see at the, at, at the scripture there, you need to excel to the edifying of the body. That is the goal, that is the, the, the thing that we're to do, not speak in tongues. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to deal with this before we get in so you'll know what I'm, where I'm thinking. The Church of God specifically has made it all about tongues in the last 10 years or better. We want to get you talking in tongues, and we think that makes you Pentecostal uh, just because you talk in tongues. And, and a preacher that I've listened to, he says, listen, uh, you need to get the Holy Ghost. You don't worry about the tongues. If you get the Holy Ghost, the tongues will come with it, but you don't need to focus on the tongues. You focus on getting the Holy Ghost. 
He said, it's like these shoes. I bought the shoes for the shoes, but the tongues come with it. And you need to understand that needs to be our focus, that we seek God to get closer to God and don't worry about what it looks like when we get it. Okay? Uh, if we get the Holy Ghost and we get filled with the Holy Ghost, He brings everything with Him. He don't leave stuff at home. Uh, so He's going to bring it all and He's going to give you what He wants you to have and we need to focus on that. <clears throat> okay. Now, so we're going to talk about tongues. Now, if you look at the way the Scripture is written in chapter 12, and I'm not going to go through it, it spells out what the gifts are. Uh, I didn't go in order. I hit tongues first because, again, it is the most controversial, if you will, of the day. Uh, I think that we all in this room are more of a similar mind than other denominations. I'm not saying we all in this room believe the same. I don't believe that. I'm just saying that we accept the activity of the Holy Ghost, the activity of tongues in this room. So uh, I don't think we're near as controversial or, or, or uh, everybody on a different page in this room. But there's some things that we really need to iron out. So let's look at this. As we're looking at tongues, the thing that we need to understand that is that there are different uh, operations of the gift of tongues. Now, I'm going to, if you'll stay with me, I'll spell out a little bit more on down a, a, a little bit about what tongues is. But, uh, so I'm not going to give a good definition in the beginning. We're just going to work our way through it. <clears throat> uh, there are different operations of the gift of tongues. There is speaking to God, and there's a scripture there, and I'll read it in a second. Speaking a message unto men from God, and then speaking it into the language of men. Now, um, if you have a question during this, this is going to be more informal. I, I'm fine with informal because some of this stuff I knew we needed to deal with, but I didn't know how to put it on paper. So if you have a question, just, just jump on in. Uh, let's read speaking to God, 1 Corinthians 14 and 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh unto not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Okay? Speaking a message... Uh, unto men from God. Now what this is, is where someone gives out, uh, as we say in the Pentecostal world, gives out a message in tongues and someone interprets. Uh, and we see uh, that referenced in chapter 14, verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course let one interpret. So he, he spells that out right there of that you'll have someone give a message in tongues and you'll have someone interpret. That's God speaking to his people, uh, directly to his people, uh, and he is letting someone give a message in tongues or, or, uh, or they are speaking in tongues. I, I think we say that's a message in tongues, but I, I would debate that. Uh, he is speaking in tongues and then someone interprets it to tell us what God is trying to say to us. That is uh, something that we see in the Pentecostal church. If you were here 15 years ago, you saw it a lot more than you do now. Uh, but it is something that is biblically based. It is not something that, that you need to be concerned with if you've never experienced it. Uh, if you're here, you've heard people speak in tongues. If you've been here long enough, you've probably heard a message given out in tongues. Uh, used to be, it happened a lot. Uh, but this is the way this, this gift of tongues, it, it, this is one of the ways that this gift of tongues work. Um, speaking in another language of men. Now, the thing that I have to be honest and transparent with you and say, I have never realized until studying uh, through this that there is no reference in chapter 12, 13, or 14 of men speaking in a language that is not their own language like uh, an American speaking Chinese or, or by the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is not referenced in any of these three chapters. However, there is a huge doctrine think, out there that believes that's the only use for tongues. Is if God's going to give you tongues, He's going to let it be because you speak in another language. And that's why some of them use the platform, you don't need it today, that, that God's not using it that way. But there's no reference in here that, of that. The reference that we see of that is on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 verse 8. And, and you can see the scripture reference there on your sheet. And now here... How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. Mm -hmm. So we see this coming out, speaking in tongues, and others in other languages understanding what they're saying. Yes, Tracy. I was just going to say, I was <clears throat> going to say that in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, it says, And men, tongues, tongues, tongues as men, and tongues of angels. And of angels. Yes, I started to put that one in here. Be? 
It could be, but it's not enough scripture, it's not enough information there for me to say yes, because there is no other reference anywhere of tongues of angels. So it could be just used as an example. You understand well, what I'm saying? The, I would think that the tongues of men would be of the other men's languages because it is the language of men. It could be. However, having a gift in that way doesn't mean now I can speak Chinese however I want to. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. But, and, and there is no gift of men speaking in languages of angels, tongues of angels. So that could be just a reference. There's not enough information there for me to say, yes, that is. I felt like, yeah, that's right. a reference. But I can't use that yet because there's not enough to say, yes, that is definitely referencing that. To me, it could be just an example. There's many places in chapters 12, 13, and 14 that reference something, but it is only to help us learn and understand. He's not saying this is how it's going to be, and I think that this could be one of them. So I couldn't bring it up. I wanted to, but I couldn't bring it up. Uh, so you can because you're in the class, but I can't because the teacher, because I'm not trying to convey that and say that is the case. Well, that was that, my my understanding of it, that that was tongues of men because men could speak be. their own language. Sure, it could be. Um, it could be, but like I said, there's some, and I don't want to get hung up on that because there, you could go back and forth. There's there's information, or, or I shouldn't say information, there's a way to look at it in both directions, and there's not enough information to solidify one way or another if you're wanting to make sure that you're understanding this. So that is the only, if you're thinking that is the reference, that's the only reference in there where it references that is a gift where God will let you speak in a language that is not your own. Now we see it on the day of Pentecost. So we obviously understand that that is something, and I've heard of it happening. I remember That's listening to a man yeah. tell a, a story of uh, he was, God fell on him in a, in a tour bus, and uh, he was over in the Jerusalem or wherever over there, and he began to speak in another language as the Holy Ghost fell on him. And the bus driver said, hey, where'd you learn Hebrew? He said, I don't know the Hebrew. He said, don't tell me. You was just speaking Hebrew telling me if I didn't get to know Jesus, I was going to go to hell uh, or whatever. You know, he, he didn't quote him exactly. He said, I, I don't know Hebrew. Uh, but we see some of that where God works in that way, and we see it on the day of Pentecost. So, but there's no reference in here. We just see that working uh, in there. Yes, sir. Every man heard in his own language. I, I debated that too. Uh, I, I'm with you on that. Okay. I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. Because uh, the Bible in Acts says every man heard him in our own language. But in another place it says it, it references that they were speaking too. So it gives both of them credit. Because I thought maybe they weren't speaking other languages. But there's another place in that chapter as someone else is describing and talking about it. It's repeated and says speaking in other I'm languages. Sure it was speaking in a tongue. That was different from the Galilean or the Nazarite or whatever. He was speaking in a tongue. Yeah. But they were hearing it in their own. But I do believe they were speaking in their own, in that other language too. So you think that every single language there, a separate man was saying it? Could be. It's hard to say or since we Peter weren't there. Peter out there blasting out the word. Well, and Peter and wasn't the only one doing it. The Bible says they all spoke in tongues. They all spoke They were so 120 had people. Own, they had their own Could've tongue. Been. Again, not enough information to solidify yes or no. Because there's 120 people. Uh, there could have been 100 different 20, 20 languages. 120 different languages. Could have been. We don't know. We do know that they were speaking in other tongues. Uh, that is one of the places where the Bible says speaking in other tongues, not speaking in an unknown tongue. And it does say that they heard. It does say in another place that they were speaking in tongues or speaking in languages uh, that were not their own. Uh, so there's not enough information to say yes or no, but nevertheless we see someone speaking in a language and it being interpreted to another person of a different language. Uh, and that is God working uh, and doing things miraculously. And he references that down in the end of chapter 14, that uh, uh, men of other languages and other tongues, I will speak my gospel. Uh, I mean, that's not a direct quote, forgive me. Uh, there's a lot to take in. I wanted to memorize all of it and I couldn't pull it off. But uh, it's a little... Going to use other people, going to use other tongues is what God's going to do, and that's what He's doing. Yes, I was say that my husband and his old church went to Mexico with with a church group, and of course they you know spoke their own language down there. But um, one of the girls who was with them talked to a Mexican girl in her language, and the the girl from the church group didn't know her language, but everybody heard it. But the girl that she spoke to, she basically 
um, told her what was going on in her life, you know, of course the Holy Spirit, you know, told her that. All right, so let me say this. I think one of the reasons why the tongues gets most controversial is because it is the gift that everybody sees a wow to it. That's, that's amazing. You know what I mean? That's an amazing story to hear. It's an amazing to hear this man speak in Hebrew. He didn't know how to speak Hebrew. However, you have to understand, this is not something to just wow people. Okay? That may happen, but we can't let that be amongst us. We can't be wowed by it. We have to say, God, you do whatever you want to, and if you don't do that around me, then fine. We can't let human experience trump the Word of God. So we have to let the Word of God tell, teach us how to live, and that tells us we have to be driven and motivated by love and the edification of the church, not the wow factor. Okay? So let's don't overemphasize. Not to mention, and this is one thing that I failed to put in here, and, and I, I, I kicked myself for it. The tongues, according to chapters 12, 13, and 14, are the least of everything that there's going to be gifts of God to give it. It's the least of all of that. He says, I'd prefer you to prophesy. I'd prefer, the Bible says, excel to the edification. That means go on past want to speak in tongues. It's the least thing you can do. He says there's first prophets, I mean apostles, secondarily prophets, then teachers, then gifts, and all of this. And he ends it with tongues. And there's other places where he talks about tongues being the least. So let's don't get caught up on the least. Let's focus on God and God alone and let God do what he wants to do. Don't get me wrong. I think we need to push for the Holy Ghost and to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I think we need to be daily filled with the Holy Ghost. And I think that's the push, not the tongues, not the gift either. So, so Let me also say that you wish that we all spoke with other tongues. Is well, the first it, it says in here that do all speak in tongues, are all prophets, are, do all prophesy. And he's just saying that's not necessarily going to be the case, that, that not everybody's going to do that. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's, it's just we're all going to be filled with the Holy Ghost if we seek God, and that's the primary thing. She's talking about 14.5. Yeah, 14.5. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm reading. Mm -hmm. It's just I would that you all speak with tongues. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Paul, but Paul's but still emphasizing the, 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 the importance of yeah, I want you all to speak in tongues, but I'd rather that you prophesy. I think that's an example of saying that kind of what I was telling Tracy. He's using this as a reference to uh, to demonstrate the importance one over the other. I would rather that you. I, I want you all to speak in tongues, but I would rather that you prophesy. He's saying don't get hung up there. Right. Move on to prophesy because that's the more important thing to edify the church. And he gives out a lot of the explanation through here. To, to demonstrate that just speaking in tongues just causes confusion if there's no interpreter uh, and things like that and, and, and that there is no building up of the church if it's just tongues without interpretation, things like that. Yesterday we had a lady that was speaking in tongues and it was clear and everybody was quiet and I really felt like that was from the Lord and I kept praying, Lord, please give us some interpretation. Well, was there an interpretation? No interpretation, no. so okay. I felt... I was to ask the same question. Okay, because we're going to deal with that. What it said. That's what I was well, to us. Now, here, here's the thing, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but at the same time, there is so much. My struggle was writing this curriculum, so I'm just going to deal with it. <clears throat> you can, there can be a tongues in the church, but if there's no interpreter, then we don't continue giving tongues again. The Bible's very right. clear in and chapter 14 that, that if there's no interpreter, you don't just move on and keep giving out tongues yeah, yeah. Then because that causes confusion. confusion. That causes uh, a, a, an uncertainty a lot of people. Uh, so because you, you, it, it actually says that if there's no interpreter, just keep silent. Yeah. The, the, and you could actually debate it whether or not we should know there's an interpreter before that's there's a tongue was, given out. But our church is not set up that way. Yeah. I, I don't know of a church set up that way. Yeah. We don't have someone designated as the interpreter. Because it can change. It, it could, absolutely. As we've talked about in the beginning, God gives these gifts to who He wants to. Uh, so, so therefore, we have to grow a whole lot toward God for God to use us the way He wants to use us. Because we don't have people who operate in that gift on a regular basis. Uh, we have people who give a tongue, uh, uh, give a, 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 a speaking in tongues, and then we have an interpreter, and that changes all the time. Uh, and the next thing you know, we see those people that don't speak in tongues anymore and don't interpret. 
So I believe that you can. There can be a, a speaking in tongues, but if there's no interpreter, then don't don't continue. Um, and and it can be debated that they shouldn't give out the message to start with. But you know, it's kind of difficult. To me, it could be a debate. It's difficult for the person giving the message in tongues to know if the interpreter is going to do what he's supposed to or she's yeah. supposed to yeah. and obey God if they have the interpretation. Quench the Spirit. Right. However, the Bible does say the Spirit is subject to the prophet. You know what I'm saying? So you, you, can, you can stop doing just because you feel it doesn't mean you've got to give it if it's not in order. Uh, so that's telling you right then and there. Don't get out of hand and say, "Well, the Holy Ghost took over. I can't. I can't control it." That's not. That's not what the Bible says. So, yes, ma'am. Um, I was fixing to speak when that happened, and I waited because I felt like it was from God, and I waited, and I thought enough time to wait to see if it was going to be interpreted, and it was not. And then, of course, I I I felt I I was feeling some things inside, and a lot of times. I felt like God wanted to give me that gift, but I quenched that. I don't want that gift. I told God I don't want the gift of interpretations. So I sat there and I thought, Lord, there must be someone here. And then some things dropped in my spirit, but I I don't want to step out on that. I, I, God well, will make, I guess it'll come well, out, but, yeah, don't, but don't, whatever. Don't, don't, don't say no more. Don't say no more. Because <laughs> but, the reason why is because I could debate with you, why would you not want to interpret the Bible says, but that's not something we do in a group. That would be terrible. That would hurt more than it would help. Uh, so I appreciate your honesty there, um, but that's a good example of saying that there could be an interpreter in the house and they're dealing with it and they're not able to give it. Uh, I've seen that. I've heard other people that's why say I'm that. That's why I'm saying you shouldn't because I've heard so many people. This girl that did that has been hurt many times. She Who did what? Because people talk about it and say she shouldn't have done it. It wasn't interpreted. It wasn't of God. Oh, no, no. That's not I'm true. not saying that. It's I'm somebody like that. maybe somebody over there like me that's supposed to do it and don't. Right. Well, that's, that's exactly my point. So you don't want to get... You don't want to get caught up on that. And that's why I said it can be debated. But but the Bible is clear. If a message is given out in tongues and no interpreter, then it stops right. from there. Yeah. Yes, what, is the, what is the scripture of the Spirit uh, subject to the prophet? Down at the bottom of chapter 14. Chapter 14. That's the only one? That's the one I'm using for the debate or the discussion that we're having. 14 what? Uh, hold on. Thirty-two, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the church of the saints. So what, what are you saying there? I'm, I'm going to go ahead and jump in deep and get some things wrapped up for me and in the class. We got a lot of we here and this and that, and to me, what if we interpret it maybe like the way that you're saying in the spirits? Of the prophets are subject to the prophet. The spirits of the prophets. The spirit of God is not the author of confusion. It says it right there in the next one. For God is not the author of confusion. Correct. Okay, but of peace. Correct. So if all this other stuff's going on and it ain't right, it's not because the prophet's in control of the spirit of God. He's in control of other spirits that are in him. There's more spirits than the spirit of God. The devil rules this world. Yeah, but that's not the spirit of the prophet. You understand what I'm saying? The, the devil is the not prophet. the spirit of the prophet. So the prophet can can ill will. Me and you've talked about this a little bit. Yeah, but okay, I so don't want to get off on on can an evil can a prophet be evil and speak in tongues? Because that's a completely different debate. Well, look, why is he having to get on to the church here to not do something that's of God? Because they are abusing it. It is a gift of God. It is it is something that God wants to use. But, all right, let me, let me put it this way. I, I'm fixing to tell you. Typically, when God comes on us, there is a ton of emotions that flood our bodies. That's just from a scientific standpoint. A ton of emotions floods our bodies. And we get to feeling things and wanting to do things. And God may give ten people or whatever, two to three, uh, in the room a message in tongues. Want them to give a message in tongues and, and give them an interpretation. <clears throat> But that emotion will make them jump the gun and do it before it's time. God may give it to them and deal with it, but he's telling them, no, there has to be a, a, a tongues, then an interpretation. Then you can move on and let it not be more than two or three. It's not a set number. It's two or three. So there's going to be a little bit of variation there. So we have people who are feeling the, 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 the operation of the Holy Ghost, and their zeal gets the best of them because 
I don't know anybody that has God. Probably so. Because of them. Because they're emotions. They're, they're getting excited and they're wanting to do what God... How many times does a new Christian get excited about God and want to do something before it's time? We all have that tendency. And if we're not careful, we will jump ahead of what God wants. Paul is putting into play some structure here to make sure that you don't have ten people trying to give a message and ten people trying to interpret all at once. One at a time for the edification of the church. And he's telling you, don't tell me you're getting excited. The, the spirits are subject to you so you can contain and you can make sure that things are done in order and, and the way that they're supposed to be. Because you got to understand, it's not a switch where, Brian, you're first, Bonnie, you're second, Daryl, you're third. God's going to deal with Brian because we got to get through Brian's flesh to make sure when I need Brian to give a message in tongues, he's ready. Just like she was demonstrating that she was struggling in a moment. I've had a similar struggle in my life at times where God's trying to deal with me. And I don't, I don't give in to it. But God's trying to get you to the place he wants you to be when it's time. So that means he's not waiting, uh, or, or he's not waiting for you to be finished to start with Bonnie. He's already working everybody in the room until they're able to put their flesh in the proper place. And if you're not careful, you'll jump ahead of it or you'll lag behind you see what I'm saying? So you have to understand that you can't say, well, I felt it and I ran with it. That's not a good enough excuse. The Bible tells you that, that, that you are in control of this thing to a degree that, that you can you don't have to just run away with your emotions. And I think that what, that's what he's telling here. If you look at the way that, that the previous scriptures are talking about everybody jumping up or, or what have you, or, or that they're not being structured in order, he's dealing with how to handle it one by one. Each prophet, one by one, is what he says, can or can prophesy. So he's telling you that you may have a message in tongues, but you may be able to prophesy, but you've got to be able to do it in order. So you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's I understand a, what you're saying, but it ain't fitting for me. Okay. You know, so I mean, okay. I'm not going to hold a class up. Okay. I mean, it's, okay. not, it's not working for me. Okay. All right, Greg, go ahead. Well, i got to share this, and then i got to go out. Okay. But I'm like her where... When I was 17 going on 18, I was, I went to a Pentecostal holiness church and I had been slain in the spirit and a person interpret, you know, did the, the tongues and I know beyond it was clear as day, the Lord, the Lord told me what to say and I was scared, nervous and never had done it and I, I chose to not interpret and run away. Did so, you interpret it after you? No, no. So it was on me and, yeah. and God hasn't given me that ability since. So I'm praying about it. But yeah, I mean, talking about lagging behind, I was lagging behind and, and I knew. Yeah. But well, like I said, I was young and naive and I didn't know that guy. I think everybody has a, everybody's going to deal with that. Whether it be a little bit or a lot, everybody's going to deal with that. So um, God's trying to make sure that there's structure and make sure that there's order for the edification of the church. I've been in churches where everything was going on at one time. And no structure, no order was brought into the house, and there was no no belief of it, uh, and and it was it could be chaos. Now, don't get me wrong. Let me let me preface statement before anybody else leaves. I'm not telling you that that there can't be a spirit in the church of God moving in the church, and 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 it be an exciting time, uh, and everybody is happy and praising the Lord and things like that. Uh, I'm not saying that. I, I believe that is absolutely biblical. Uh, we're just talking about tongues today. I don't think that we need to get carried away with, with, with tongues or without tongues and think that's the way one way or the other should be. I'm not saying either. We've got to be willing to follow God throughout uh, whatever he wants to do in, in the class, the church, the, the, the home meeting, or whatever it is. So just make sure I'm not dismissing tongues. I'm not saying we got to all be in tongues. I'm not saying one or the other. The Bible talks about there's a proper way to do both. Somebody, I don't know who was raising their hands. You raised yours? I seen a hand. I couldn't tell who it was. Well, when you look at this section, this is, to me, this is the type of a discipline section. Because when we, look, when we slipped down just a few more, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I was thinking what you were saying, the way you had spoke it, that's why I, was, I wanted to see that. I've read that a many times. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That's plural spirits, so that's something different. And when you go right on down the next two lines, he jumps into something totally different. And we can't be a part of it. Uh, and, and let this just go. But just look at two more verses down there. And what he's going, what he's doing. He's, he's 
the Corinthian Talking about church, your women keep the silent. Corinthian church is yeah, a Yeah, I mean, so he's, he's showing that he's the author of peace. And we start coming down through here, and he's telling them about these tongues, and then he's telling them about the women talking. And there's some things going on in Corinth that ain't right. I agree with that, and that's why. I, and I'm thinking this was more based on people not being God-filled, but I don't know why he didn't just spill it out that don't be doing this mess and causing confusion because it, the tongue deal, and you know it to be true, and all of us in this room, that there's a lot of garbage going on out here in our denomination. Sure. So, or is he talking to the Corinthian church? Because God's not the author of confusion. A prophet is subject to the spirits, not the spirit. There ain't no spirits of God. It's the spirit. Okay. Let's 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 table that for a moment then. Okay. We'll table that. Because well, I, because we're looking at the scripture in two different ways. I, I get that. I get that. I'm trying to make sure that we understand that there is a structure and order. And I don't want to get off on deciding if there's more than one spirit or not, or if he's right. talking about women or to the Corinthians, because that opens up four other discussions. Well, I'm just trying to keep in, uh, in context. Order, context. I'm with you. What's I don't think what I'm saying is out of context. Right. Well, and I don't, but I want to make sure that I'm right. Sure. So sure. I'm not running around over here twisting and chasing my tail. Right, right. You know, what you're, with, what you're trying to do is show us that the order it's supposed to be in, like Paul said. Correct. Making sure that we understand that there is an order and it can't just be a free for all. Right. Because that's the main thing. Yes, ma'am. I done forgot. Okay. Well, <laughs> is it gifts of the spirit that prophecy and interpretation, or is that spirit of prophecy, spirit of interpretation? It's gifts of the spirit. It's one spirit. Uh, and gifts come with the one spirit. As we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the Bible at the beginning of this is that there is uh, one God, but many gifts, different operations, but one Lord, uh, and, and different, you know, the way it works out, but one spirit giving each man the way he sees fit. So it's one Holy Ghost, and he gives them all. Uh, some of them he gives me maybe, but give you more. It doesn't matter, it's up to him. But one spirit giving all the gifts. Somebody else? Yes. Alright, um, I just got a question. How do you know your gifts? Like, as a new person? You have to understand something. When, when, that's a good question. The, the, the modern church today, and man, I'm out of time. The modern church today would love to believe and make you believe that you're born with these gifts and you just have them all the time. But that's not the way... I don't believe that's the way the scripture points it out. You get filled, you get saved, and you get filled with the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is what you have. God will operate these gifts through you, and He may operate them for a while and may take them back. So it's not a matter of, of I got a gift of singing and I always can sing. You can't put that same de uh, uh, explanation on the gifts of tongues, interpretation, uh, or, or healings, or faith, or any of the other gifts. That's not the way these gifts are, are given. They are not given in a way of it's yours, do what you want to with it. It is a, this is a gift to the church that I'm going to use through you as a vessel. So you have to wait for God to move on you in a way to, to say, I'm going to operate this gift through you today. Can you accept that? That's uh, it's kind of an elementary way to word it as far as the way God may deal with you. I don't know what he may say, uh, but it's not going to be a gift that you have necessarily to say I've got this all the time uh, it may not be now don't get me wrong I've known people who God may give the gift of healing and they use it a bunch for years uh, but I wouldn't say that they got it and it's theirs and they can do what they want to it is God using them in that gift over and over and over again it's just they have able to maintain their relationship where God can consistently use them in that gift when, when, when I'm given a gift of singing when I was born. I don't typically lose that, but that's not a gift like this is. So you can't test and say, what gift do I got? Or, you know, do I got the gift of healing and don't know it? No, that's not the way it works. It's not like that. God's going to use you in the gift of healing maybe, but it's not necessarily yours that he gave to you for the rest of your life. You understand what I mean? Okay. Now, he, he may use you a bunch. I'm just saying it's not viewed the same way other talents 
We use the word gift and talent, inter, you know, to interchange, and we should. No. Talent is one thing. Gift of God is completely different. It's just where the wording is used, and I'm trying to use the same words to make sure you understand what I'm saying. Can I, yeah, yes, ma'am. My mom told me a long time ago that my grandpa, he went blind when he was 21 years old. When my mom hit, I think she said she was 30 years old, and she said that God woke her up in the middle of the night and told her to go pray for my grandpa's eyes that he would see if she prayed for him. But she got scared, and she's like, why would God use me? I'm not worthy of healing my father's eyes. And she let it go. She went to my grandfather the next morning and told him what had happened. He got so upset. He's like, if you would have if you would have got up and done what God told you to do, my eyesight would have came back. But he did he hasn't used her in that in that way any other any other time in her life. That was the only time he yeah. was gonna and it possibly could have happened. I mean if, if it she, could have. Yeah. God was going to use her in the gift of healing, but that doesn't make her to have the spiritual gift of healing for the rest of her life. You want to say something? Else? I was going to say you're talking about uh, like not having the gift and not having it. And different, he will give different people different gifts, some more than others, like you said. Uh, like tongues, I've had, ever since I received the baptism, it's never left me. But the gift I have found that the gift of faith has come and went with me. There's been times like when my grandchild, who's 20 something now, was 12, and they told her that she, my daughter that she had cancer. Uh, and uh, I said, no, she will not. She will not. And the, it just like the gift of faith kicked in. And my daughter said, but mama, they ran tests. I, I, she will not. You need to have faith. And she did not have cancer. And in another, there's another grandchild something happened to, and I had that gift of faith came on me again. But then there's times when I had you know, that faith, you know, and it didn't happen. But there sure. was times when it actually, I can tell this the gift of faith, and no, I, it will not happen. So it, it, you can, you, you'll know when it comes on you. Right. And we've got to all deal with that. Yes, sir. Yeah, class, I don't want y'all to think that I'm trying to uh, change what Sharp's trying to teach or whatever. I am trying to Learn yourself. get deep in this word and dissect everything to for myself as well as y'all. Right. Okay. I, I I'm wanting to know everything that there is to know about this Bible and about everything that we're teaching. Here. I am very passionate about this class. I hope y'all know that. So it's not a it's not a me at Sharp kind of thing. I just if it comes off that way, that's just the way I am. I'm, to, I'm cut to the deal. I think we know our teachers well enough to know that's not yeah. how it is. Right. Right. Uh, all right. So we'll take it that way. I, I'm wanting to know what he's teaching is right. The way I'm seeing it is more of a reprimand thing. So I just got to work through it, and we will get through it together. So when we leave out of here, it's one accord. Remember, that's how we say right. we yeah. want to be in this class. I think we can all express how we feel, and don't make you've got to believe the way right. I believe you believe. Because I don't believe well, we wonder, uh, that, that a prophet can have a bad spirit and a good spirit. In him. I don't believe. Well, that. and I, I, I appreciate you, you, you know, saying that because Brian and I have had many discussions outside the class. Some of them get passionate because me and Brian are passionate people about the Word of God, but. We're good friends no matter what. Because, you know, we're brothers. We can disagree and it's fine, or we can yeah. agree and it's fine. Uh, you know, God can show us both something, and that's what we count on. So, uh, as you can see, there's a lot to cover in this. I apologize if, if the curriculum is not adequate. I struggled four different ways to write this curriculum because there's so much to cover, so much to explain. I did the best I could do, so we're going to work through it. We may chunk this curriculum when it's over on this particular lesson. Uh, I'm just trying to get through it. You just need to pray more and have better answers. <laughs> I need to pray more for the class, obviously. Certain members of the class in particular. No. Let, let's pray. Let's, let's go so we can get out. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your people. We thank you for your spirit that can keep your people in unity. God, we thank you for you. God, we bless you and praise you that you can teach us and talk to us and help us to understand and God, I pray that you would do that. I pray that you would teach what I have no ability to teach. I pray that you would help us to understand, that you would give us the anointing to explain, give us the anointing to hear, give us the anointing to completely be in one accord to know what your word said. 
and help us, God, to to uh, to hear what you have to say. Not what I got to say, but what you got to say, so that you can be teaching me as well, Lord. Help us to know what you want said, that we understand the doctrine that you want us to understand, God. Help us to be in your will and in your ways, God. We bless you, we praise you, thank you, Chris, in Jesus' name.